notice from the Minister of Health that he wishes to make a statement. Before I call the Minister, I would remind members that in light of social distancing being observed by parties, the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a question has been relaxed. Members do still have to make sure their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called, but they can do this by rising in their place as well as notifying the business office or speaker's table directly. I remind members to be concise in asking their questions. I also remind members that in accordance with long established procedure, points of order are not normally taken during a statement or the question period afterwards. And if I the Minister, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I wish to make the following statement on the 22nd North South Ministerial Council meeting in the Health and um, Food Safety Sectoral Format, which was held by video conference on the 2nd of October 2020. Junior Minister Declan Kearney, MLA, and I represented the Northern Ireland Executive at the meeting, while the Irish Government was represented by Stephen Donnelly, TD, Minister for Health, and Minister Donnelly chaired the meeting. The statement has been agreed with Junior, Junior Minister Kearney, and I am making it on behalf of both of us. The following topics were discussed, and decisions were taken where appropriate. The Council renewed its expression of appreciation to all those who have played a part in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and in particular the health and social care workers who have led the frontline response. We welcome the close and productive cooperation that has taken place between health ministers, chief medical officers and health administrations, north and south, to deliver an effective public health response. The Council noted that since the meeting of the senior representatives of the Northern Ireland Executive and the Irish Government and their chief medical officers at the NSMC Secretariat offices in Armagh on the 14th of March to review the situation regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, and senior representatives from both administrations have continued to meet regularly to discuss the ongoing COVID-19 response. We noted that the chief medical officers had met on the 25th of September to review the ongoing response to the pandemic, including the particular challenges being faced in the North West region and the joint statement issued following that meeting. We recall the, the Memorandum of, of Understanding on Public Health Cooperation and COVID-19 Response agreed between Departments of Health North and South on the 7th of April. The Council noted the further Memorandum of Understanding for the sharing of anonymous uh, diagnosis keys generated by each jurisdiction, um, each jurisdiction's COVID-19 proximity app was agreed between Departments of Health, again North and South, on the 30th of July. We welcome the achievement of interoperability on an all-island basis of the apps deployed in each jurisdiction. The Council notice, noted that health ministers will continue to meet both within the NSMC and outside the structures of the Council to discuss the response to the pandemic. We discussed the implications of the UK withdrawal from the EU, and the Council noted the update uh, provided on the matter. The Council noted the current work programme in the health sector and welcome progress, progress made to date in the relevant areas. We noted that an update paper on the review of the work programme will be brought to the next meeting in this sector. We noted that a review of the current Child Protection Work Programme, which was underway in 2016, was recommenced, and a draft revised All-Ireland Work Programme will be presented at a future health sectoral meeting. The Council noted that the All-Ireland Congenital Heart Disease Network has successfully delivered its initial work programme and will move forward with the next phase of establishing the academic partnership and developing the research programme. Ministers also noted that a memorandum of understanding between the Beaumont Hospital in Dublin and the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust have been signed for a north-south living donor exchange kidney transplant service. The Council noted the success of the North West Cancer Centre in providing radiotherapy services for the whole North West region and delivering the highest standards of specialist care with the latest high-tech radiotherapy equipment. The Council noted that patients with ST segment elevation my, myocardial infraction from County, Dol, County Donegal continue to be transferred to Elton Galvin for primary pericontinuous coronary intervention treatment. Ministers noted that both jurisdictions intend to maximise opportunities of the new cross border structural funds programme, Peace Plus, which is currently in development. The Council noted that updated memorandum of understanding in place between the ambulance services to provide for cross-border assistance in the management and the resourcing of emergency and urgent calls and declared major incidents. Minister also noted that the cooperation on working together cross-border health and social care partnership is continuing to benefit from EU funding. 
to support cross-border service delivery and is currently leading four health-stranded interreg 4A pro, 5A projects and partnering in a fifth, including projects which focus on acute services, mental health, population health, primary care and older people and children's services, with a total all allocation of approximately €37 million. Euro. The Council noted that the potential for collaboration between Ireland and Northern Ireland on the implementation of appropriate aspects of their drug and alcohol strategies will be explored. They also nor noted that the North-South Alcohol Policy Advisory Group, which was established to contribute to reducing alcohol-related harm on the island of Ireland, has continued to meet since 2016. Ministers also noted the update on smoking initiatives in both jurisdictions, including tobacco-free Ireland, electronic cigarettes and banning smoking in cars. The Council noted that in February 2020, the Department of Health uh, published a mid-term review of its tobacco control strategy and that the development of the strategy was assisted by the Institute of Public Health in Ireland, who provided a comprehensive evidence review and facilitated a stakeholder engagement exercise. Ministers noted that the various research initiatives under the Physical Activity Plan have been progressed on an online basis, including the Irish Physical Acti Activity Cl Cl Collaboration and the Children's Sport Participation in Physical Activity stud Study led by Sport Ireland and Sport Northern Ireland. The Council noted that suicide prevention continues to be a key priority in both jurisdictions and that the Department of Health in Northern Ireland Protect Life 2 suicide prevention strategy is being implemented and new structures have been established to drive progress. Ministers noticed that a memorandum of understanding has been developed between the Health Service Executive Ireland and Psychological Response to COVID-19 programme and the Department of Health in Northern Ireland. Mental Health and the Resilient Strategic Working Group to engage in cooperation and collaboration in psychological response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Council noted that the cross-border steering group of officials co-chaired by the Department of Health in Northern Ireland and the Department of Children and Youth Affairs in the Republic of Ireland continue to meet to promote a coordinated approach on children protection issues. The Council noted the, the updated provision, including the updating of the protocol between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland for handling interjurisdictional child cases, and that an updated protocol will be considered at a future stage of the North South Ministerial Council. The CEO of Safe Food provided an, an overview of the work of Safe Food and made reference to high level achievements and campaigns, including successful campaigns related to hand washing, childhood obesity, cooking chicken, and cooking burgers. The Council noted that Safe Food has developed and distributed various resources in educational settings. Ministers noted that Safe Food has engaged with customers on social media and carried out research in relation to food allergens, folate status in women, lifetime cost of childhood overweight and obesity, food portion sizes, treat foods and the impact of climate change on dairy production. The Council noted that Safe Food had developed networks, including community food initiatives, knowledge networks, and the All Island Obesity Action Forum. The Council noted Safe Food attendance at the Balmoral Show and Plowing Championships, highlighting the Childhood Obesity Campaign. The Council also noted the progress of the tripartite, tripartite initiative uh, between Safe Food, the Public Health Agency, and the Food Standards Agency in Northern Ireland in rolling out minimum nutritional standards for catering for staff and, and visitors in health and social care settings. The Council noted Safe Food's annual reports and accounts for the years 2016, 17 and 18, which have been laid before the Northern Ireland Assembly and before both houses of the Eruptus. Ministers noticed, noted that Safe Food has prepared a draft 2022 corporate plan, which includes a 2020 business plan. And that following approval by the sponsor departments and finance ministers, it will be submitted to the North South Ministerial Council for approval at the earliest opportunity. The Council noted that Safe Food business plans for 17, 18, and 2019 will be presented to the Council for approval at a future meeting. Ministers approved two appointments to the Safe Food Advisory Board and 11 appointments to the Safe Food Advisory Committee. Ministers approved the appointment of Mr. Ray Dolan as CEO of the Food Safety Promotion Board, better known as Safe Food. Um, finally, we agreed that the next North-South Ministerial Health and Food Safety meeting will be held in early 2021. I call Colum Gildenew, the Chair of the Health Committee, to ask a question. 
the Minister. Thank you, Minister, for coming and making this statement today. Um, and I just want to acknowledge briefly the, uh, how much I welcome the consultation on soft organ donation that you announced. I think that's a, a, a brilliant uh, to see that progressing. Um, so, Minister, there are considerable areas of potential cooperation between North and South, many of which you set out. Did you take the opportunity to discuss? the lack of paediatric pathology here in the north and to explore the possibility of having those services on an all-Ireland basis? And also, can you outline what plans there are to build on the good work of COT, which you referenced there, following, as, as you said, considering uh, the fact that it involves £37 million? Thank you. Um, I, I thank the Chair for, for his questions. And, and look, in regard to uh, the announcement of the the consultation on organ donation. You know, I welcome the chair's support and the, the support from many members across this house who have already been in contact in regards to this. In regards for for paediatric um, paediatric pathology, it wasn't touched on at that minute uh, at that meeting, and it wasn't included in the minute. But it is something that I and my officials have been engaging with, not just on a north south, but an east, on an east west basis, because it is something that has been raised previously in this house. And it comes about due, due to that lack of services, the lack of skilled and trained paediatric uh, pathologists, not just available here uh, in Northern Ireland or Southern Ireland, but also across, uh, I, I think, across Western Europe at this point in time. In regards for the expansion of, of the COT and the work that's going there, in regards to that circa 37 million uh, euro support, there is ongoing conversations between ourselves, uh, the Republic of Ireland, and the UK government in regards to how this work can be continued and also funded as well. I call Pam Cameron for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement to the House this morning. And I think, Minister, it has never been more important that uh, we have good communication with our neighbours in uh, the Republic of Ireland as it is within this pandemic. Would the Minister outline what discussions or communications he, is, he and his department have had in relation to um, managing any future strains of coronavirus? And I give Denmark scenario as um, an example of that. And perhaps the Minister could also clarify whether private um, care workers from Republic of Ireland uh, working within Northern Ireland will be able to access the UK COVID vaccine. Thank you. Um, and I thank the member for appointing it is. Uh, in regards to the new strains, it, was one of, it wasn't raised um, at that meeting because uh, the strain found in Mel Bank in Denmark at that point in time actually hadn't been discovered or disclosed. Um, but I have had conversations with um, my, my counterpart in the Republic of Ireland. It has also been raised at a UK-wide basis as well in regards to our concerns that there are three mink farms operating in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, in regards to, to the update that we have received both at a Northern Ireland level and a UK level, we are assured by the Republic of Ireland authorities that they have tested their mink and that current strain that did cause the concern in Denmark has not been detected and is not present, but they continue to monitor uh, that situation. In regards to access of, of the COVID vaccine, uh, we are clear it is those employees when they meet that criteria when we get down to that level. It is employees of the health service, uh, irrespective of residency. Uh, so it is our employees we will, we will be protecting and supporting. Here, Mayor Cara Hunter for New Cash. I call Cara Hunter for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his statement today. Minister, I am delighted to hear uh, suicide prevention is a priority both uh, in your department and your equivalent in the South. Uh, can you outline what discussions you have had together uh, regarding suicide prevention so far? Um, I, and I thank the member, and can I welcome her to her place on the, the Health Committee um, in regards to, to the issues that she continually brings uh, to, to this House in regards to, to suicide and in regards to mental health. Uh, mental health and suicide prevention are priority areas for the Executive, uh, and going forward through the implementation of the Protect Life 2, uh, the Mental Health Action Plan, and the future publication of the new Mental Health Strategy. Protect Life 2, as the member will be aware, focuses on suicide prevention uh, as a societal issue and seeks to ensure collaborative cross-departmental engagement to address risk factors for suicide and self-harm, as well as engagement uh, across uh, wider society. As members are aware, Professor Siobhan O'Neill has recently been appointed as under mental health champion 
and Siobhan, um, in my opinion, on, on many of the sector, will be a positive voice in advancing emotional well-being uh, and good mental health. Uh, in regards to the conversations that we continue to have uh, with the Republic of Ireland, a wide range of work continues on a cross-border basis to tackle emotional health and well-being, mental health and suicide prevention. And that includes the collaborative work through the self-harm registry, work with sporting bodies, official teleconferences on COVID response to mental health, and the development of our memorandum of understanding on the psychological response and support for families in the cases of suicides in border areas. Um, hard copies of a concerned about suicide leaflet have been distributed throughout local areas across Northern Ireland, uh, with a print rerun of the leaflet delivered each year. Uh, this is actually a common resource that will be used in Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, albeit with some variance in information contained with it depending on the area. Uh, the Public Health Agency also continues to support Lighthouse Northern Ireland in coordinating discussions with the Department of Health and the Southern Health sector to gain support for the flourish uh, for an all-island approach. Focus, focus groups and pilot training have now been implemented, implemented and evaluated in the Republic of Ireland. I call Paula Bradshaw. Speaker, um, Minister, in 2015, the young people in England benefited from legislation that banned smoking in cars with under 18s present. And I welcome um, reference there to smoking cars in, in your statement. Could you please give the House an update on legislation here and whether it will be aligned in both jurisdictions? Thank you. Um, and, I, and again, I, I thank the member, because if I recall right back in 2015, I think it was actually a party colleague, John McAllister, actually brought uh, that issue um, forward to the House. Uh, and just to update the member, draft regulations ought to introduce a ban on smoking in private cars when children are present, present and actually to prohibit the sale of e-cigarettes to minors are being progressed and will be subject to assembly debate. A mid-term review of the Tobacco Control Strategy for Northern Ireland was published uh, and updated on the 11th of February 2020. That review assesses progress made against targets and objectives and makes recommendations for the remaining term of the strategy. This work was supported by an extensive evidence review taken forward by the Institute of Public Health in Ireland, uh, and there has been unfortunately a delay in implementing the mid-term review recommendations as a result of COVID-19, but we hope to resume this work soon. Call Jonathan Buckley for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his statement. Minister, can I ask if you have had the opportunity to discuss with your counterpart in the Republic of Ireland about the Dying with Dignity Bill uh, that is going through the Oireachtas and its potential worry and implications for the people of Northern Ireland? Uh, and if not, could you please provide a time frame in which you would seek such uh, uh, engagement with the counterpart in the Republic? Um, I, I think the member for his point is something that has been raised um, with me. In regards, I haven't discussed it with my counterpart in the Republic of Ireland because my understanding is it's currently a private member's bill. It's not one that's been brought forward by the government. It hasn't been brought uh, to the committee stage as of yet. But I do know there are concerns being raised with uh, health prof and, and, and concerns with health professionals across Northern Ireland that should have come into being what impl uh, implications there will be for Northern Ireland residents. So it's not a topic of discussion we have had yet because of the status of the bill and its position currently within the Doyle. Iram Sir Orlia Flynn, for new case, I call Orlia Flynn for a question. Um, I thank the Minister for his statement. And Minister, in the statement, um, you acknowledge the close and productive cooperation that has been taking place between the health ministers, the CMOs and both administrations. Um, I would just like to ask if you can confirm if the issue around the sharing of the traveller information data, north and south, um, if that issue has finally been addressed and hopefully resolved. Thank you. Um, and again, this has been a matter of, of great concern, which, which I have raised on numerous occasions between uh, any conversations I've had with my counterpart in the Republic of Ireland. As of yet, it has not been resolved. Great to, 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 my, to my frustration and, and disappointment. Uh, we have written again to Stephen Donnelly at the end of last week, and he has uh, responded just um, at the weekend in regards to laying out, uh, I think, for some of what is the first time of the specific details um, of their concerns. And that is the fact that there is a concern that any information they will be passing into our jurisdiction will be used for legally um, 
and forcing people to self-isolate, which isn't a requirement in the Republic of Ireland. So now that we actually understand their specific uh, concern, uh, which is something they said had been raised, which they, they had raised in the past without that, that level of detail, it's something that we'll be able to work our way around to see if there is a solution that we can bring. But it does remain a, mem a, a serious area of concern that people can enter, not just Northern Ireland, but the UK via Dublin, and not uh, transfer that information as seamlessly and as, as openly uh, as we would like. But it's something that, that my officials uh, continue to work with, with Stephen's officials, to make sure that we can provide uh, a legal resolution uh, to put as a problem that, that we wish wasn't there, I think, from both sides, but it's, it's just due to the technicalities and legalities that seem to be causing the, the sticking point. I call Pat Sheehan for a question. Thanks very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister as well for his uh, statement this morning. And, uh, first of all, I'd like to say I also welcome the consultation on soft, out, of soft opt out organ donation. Uh, I know the Minister has met young Dahi and his parents, Marcin and Seth, who, who come from my constituency, and actually Dahi attends the same school as my children. And I know they are overjoyed at the beginning of this consultation, and they see it as another step forward in their campaign. But just uh, moving on to the issue of North South cooperation. Can the Minister provide information on the cooperation uh, on contact tracing between North South? Uh, Who is collecting the data? How is it shared uh, between the North and the South? And how can that uh, information be accessed for examination? Um, and, and I think the member he, he will be aware. Um, sorry, I, and again, I, I will start by saying I thank him for his support in regards to to the soft opt out. I think anybody that meets Dahi will not fail to be convinced that this is a worthy cause because such a such 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 a, a strength of character for what the child has come through and what many other children are currently going through. If there's anything I think in this house that we can do uh, to provide help uh, and support, uh, we, we should be doing and that's why I look forward to, to the members' support when we do bring it to committee and further to this house to to get it in place. In regards to, to the sharing and, and contact tracing and the, and the sharing of, of the app, there is uh, continual uh, conversations between my officials and the Public Health Agency and the Republic's uh, contact tracing service in regards to sharing of data, especially around the border areas. Um, that's done on, on weekly, if not daily, basis, depending on the size or if there's an outbreak in a, in a certain location. But one of the things and one of the early advantages that we had, and I mentioned earlier on, was in regards to the interoperability of our proximity apps and the sharing of data and the, the alerts that's coming there. While no data is actually captured through the app, uh, the number of shares that are going back and forth across the border actually show that it is, that it is being effective. Uh, to date, um, there has been 5,620 alerts received to Northern Ireland app holders from the Republic of Ireland's uh, app service, and 8,355 uh, going the other way. So, where our app has, has alerted 8,355 people in the Republic of Ireland. So, that sharing of information on our contact tracing apps is working well, and also through our contact tracing teams is also proven uh, very valuable, especially when we see those large numbers of outbreaks that were previously having, especially in border areas. Here are Mayor Matthew Toole for Anya Kesht. I call Matthew Toole for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for his update. Further to what he's just said, it's encouraging to note that there were sounds like 13,000 in total cross-border alerts in one way or the other. Can he um, assure us that if there is no thoroughgoing EU-UK deal on data sharing provision, that there won't be any disruption to that uh, cross-border um, uh, contact tracing, which is critical. Can you also give us a broader update on what was discussed in relation to EU exit um, at the NSMC? Um, I think the member, there, there, is no, uh, there is no concern about the sharing um, of that data um, in regards to what way it will implement following um, following Brexit on, at the end of this month. Uh, in regards to cooperation, in regards to 
specifically EU funds and, and funding projects. What we discussed was that the health and social care services across the island of Ireland, although facing major challenges and meeting rising demand uh, within a constrained fiscal, fiscal environment, the situation has been made more difficult by the pandemic. But in the context of EU programmes like Interreg 5A, uh, they are extremely valuable, not only in terms of the funding which they provide, but also in facilitating new ways of collaborating and delivering services on a cross-border basis. Uh, the withdrawal agreement reflects the continued commitment of the EU and the UK to the North-South Interreg and Peace programmes uh, funded under the current MMF 1420 and to the UK's participation in future Peace Plus programmes. So continued access to current EU competitive funds such as Horizon 2020 is also guaranteed under the terms of the withdrawal agreement and the arrangements whereby the UK may be able to access the successor programme Horizon Europe are subject to ongoing negotiations um, within the EU. Eremar John O'Dowd, for Hanya Cash. I call John O'Dowd for a question. Uh, you. Uh, Minister, you have covered a number of areas in relation to COVID and how uh, various jurisdictions are cooperating with each other. But in the principle or in relation to the memorandum of understanding, what is your assessment of how it is working overall? In regards to, to the specific memorandum of understanding that we have in regards to COVID, uh, it is working well. But I think, uh, as I said in an earlier answer, it could be working better especially in regards to the data sharing of those passengers arriving in the Republic of Ireland, travelling into Northern Ireland. So at an official level um, and a ministerial level, there is co good cooperation and coordination uh, between CMOs, public health agencies, contact tracing services, but there are still those legalities that we do need to challenge. I don't think they could have been covered in that specific detail in the Memorandum of Understanding, but I think by the way that both jurisdictions work together and, and how we combat COVID and what is necessary. That memorandum has, has built a, a firm foundation, but there's still work that can be progressed in regards to some of the specific challenges that we see developing uh, on a daily, if not a weekly basis, and different challenges that COVID presents. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I note that this statement uh, does not start with the usual recital that it is made pursuant to section 52 of the Northern Ireland Act. Presumably the reason for that is that it is in flagrant breach of section 52C of the Act, which requires such statements to be made as soon as reasonably practicable. Why is it that two and a half months has passed before the Assembly uh, uh, has the privilege of hearing this statement? And on, and in terms of its content, it refers to the radiotherapy treatment provided at the cancer, Northwest Cancer Centre for citizens of Donegal and the coronary service provided for citizens of Donegal at Oak Nagelvin. Could the Minister remind the House of the funding arrangements that pertain in that regard, and are those funding arrangements being met? Um. Uh, in regards to, to the opening paragraphs, the member will know there is no uh, dereliction of my point in coming forward in regards to the support uh, and openness that I give to this House, because I think if he looks at any record uh, in regards to ministerial attendance and openness in, in regards to answering questions, moving regulations, I think he will find that I am in fact uh, here more often than most. In regards um, to, to the specifics he asks in regards to finance and finance support, um, DFP and DHSSPS approval uh, for the radiotherapy unit at Alton and Galvin was given actually in May 2014. Uh, there was a capital cost of £66.1 million, which included a £19 million contribution from the Republic of Ireland, uh, and that was for the day-to-day -day running costs, are actually shared between the two jurisdictions according to the terms of a service level agreement, which is currently being reviewed. Uh, the review is taking longer than anticipated, as the number of patients referred for treatment has not been as high as initially anticipated, and that review is likely to be completed uh, shortly. I am sure when it is reported, I will provide the detail with the member so he is aware of the exact figures. 
Aaron, or Jerry Carroll for Newcastle. Call Jerry Carroll for. Thank you, uh, Minister. I want to welcome the news on the soft uh, opt-out uh, consultation as well. Great news for Wee Dahi and so many others across the north. Um, uh, Minister, there has been increased uh, concerns raised about future pathogens and zoonotic diseases, maybe mutations, possibly of COVID. Hopefully not, but a real possibility. Uh, one reason, uh, the main reason for these, uh, is factory farming. Was there any discussions uh, in the meeting about tackling uh, the increased problem of factory farming across the island uh, at the meeting? Thank you. Um, and again, I, I thank the member for his comments. And as I indicated, um, this meeting was actually held before there was a mink out or the outbreak of COVID in a mink farm in Denmark, so it wasn't something uh, that was touched on. Uh, so in regards to the specific of factory farming, it doesn't fall under my remit uh, as Health Minister or actually under Safe Food, which is about the consumption of, of food and how it's produced uh, as a food substance and the effects in regards to obesity uh, and good diet rather than actually farm, farm factory farming uh, and the initial production, which would fall under the dear minister's responsibility. So it may be a question that's better suited for him under his north-south ministerial council discussions. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his statement. Uh, minister, you did allude earlier to uh, the uh, issue of, of travellers coming in uh, via Dublin Airport. Uh, are you satisfied uh, with the level of cooperation that your officials are receiving from uh, officials in the Republic of Ireland uh, and helping to tighten up the release of data uh, of travellers arriving via Dublin Airport, then travelling home to Northern Ireland? Thank you. Um, as I said to, to you in, a, in a previous answer, I, I had hoped for, for more engagements on the specific in this, but now that we know actually what the Republic of Ireland's government's concerns specifically are, we will be fit to, to address those, and I hope we can find a, a speedy resolution because it is an area of concern. Uh, I am informed that our departmental officials are, are meeting today with officials from the Republic of Ireland actually to discuss this matter of, in hand um, following a letter I asked to, issued uh, to my Irish counterpart last week. Here, Mayor Declan McAleer for your cash. I call Declan McAleer for a question. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I thank the Minister for his statement. Is the Minister concerned at the impact that Brexit could have on food safety and what mitigations could be uh, put in place to address these concerns? Um, and again, for the, for, for the specifics of food safety, uh, which come under the remit of, of safe food, it is about promotion of how you cook, how you use obesity in regards to, to the use of food and more so than the the challenges that will come to the supply of food post Brexit. So, in regards to the work that Safe Food will continue to do, in regards to sensible eating, good nutrition, how we tackle obesity, and actually how food is actually cooked, I think one of the, the updates we actually received uh, on the on the day was one of the the main uh, points of information that Safe Food have on its website that has been accessed uh, the most throughout the world and has international contacts is how to cook a turkey at Christmas. So it's that sort of advice that Safe Food supplies. So that will not change. The work that Safe Food does will not change come the end of this month or come transition. Um, so I have no concerns that the work that they do will continue to the high standard that they currently do. That concludes questions on the statement. And just members, if I could say at this point, could we make sure that parties ensure that their names are supplied to the top table? It, it can be quite difficult to try and second guess um, who wants to speak. Okay, please. Uh, thanks. <laughs>